Okay, pick it back up here. This slide is not here for you to learn anything from it right now. This is just a brief mention that we haven't covered all the estate yet. What do we say an estate was? What does the word estate mean? It's a relationship. We've only covered half of the picture because we've covered the freehold estates. What does freehold mean? Ownership. ownership. We've covered the ownership estate. So what estates does that leave that we have not talked about? The leases. And we're not going to talk about them now. This, that's why this is here is just sort of as a reference point of we haven't completed the picture yet with estates. This is coming up in chapter 11. That's the landlord and tenant chapter. But I just got you this slide here as a reminder of, hey, these are not all the estates. Those seven that we talked about, those are the ones that are ownership estates. We still have the leasehold estates or leases to deal with later on. All right? Everybody good with that? Now, moving along. I don't know the time now. Moving along, we need to talk about more than one owner at a time. So far, when we talk about ownership, we've talked about solo ownership. Ownership by just one person at a time. That is called ownership, believe it or not, in severalty. It's a dumb word. I get it. Ownership in severalty means there is only one owner. Not several, but one. Ownership in severalty means there is a solo owner, just one owner. That's really easy to understand. You only have one person, what percentage of the property do they own? 100%. We don't have to worry about a relationship with anybody else. But that's not how most real estate is owned. Most real estate is owned by multiple owners at the same time. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. I mean, think about it. Most people, do they own their house by themselves or do they own it with somebody else? Somebody else. Usually somebody else. Who, who is that most commonly for a house? Spouse. Their spouse. That would be the most common for something like a house. But even with investment properties and business ownerships and those kinds of things that own real property, it's pretty common to have more than one owner at the same time. That is called concurrent ownership. The word concurrent just means more than one at a time. That's all it means. Concurrent is more than one at a time. So when you put it together with ownership, concurrent ownership, what do you think that means? How many owners are we dealing with? Several. More than one. More than one. Whether that's two or 22 or 2022, we don't know, but it's more than one. Because if there's only one owner, it would be ownership in what? Several. In severalty. Okay? So, concurrent ownership. Now, I, what I, here's what I want to point out to you, because this is where you're going to start to get confused. This is not different from what we just talked about. This is taking what we just talked about and built on it. Concurrent owners can own something fee simple absolute. It just means instead of thus far, we've talked about how many owners at a time of something. We've only talked about one. Now we're taking that ownership and we're splitting it up amongst multiple people. They still would have fee simple absolute ownership. Or they still would have fee simple determinable ownership. Just instead of there being one person that has fee simple absolute ownership, there would be two or three or 33, whatever that number happens to be. Is everybody okay with that idea? This is not separate from what we just talked about. It's just taking it now and expanding it out to more than one owner at a time. There are three possibilities when it comes to having more than one owner at a time. They're called tenancy in common, joint tenancy, and tenancy by the entirety. We're going to talk in detail about each one of the three. They have different situations where they're used. Sometimes you can control what you get. Sometimes you can't control what you get as a concurrent owner. But what these are about is the relationship between the owners. What relationship do they have? There are important things here like what share do they own? Do they have equal ownership? Because here's the thing, it's possible to have unequal ownership shares. We could have two owners. We could have, for example, Jackie and Christina own a property together and Jackie owns 80% of the property and Christina owns 20%. That's possible. We can have unequal ownership shares. 
So we have to know what type of ownership allows for that. Because the truth is, only one of those three allows for unequal ownership shares. Is everybody with me on that? The other two require it to be even. One of these three is only available to people that are married. So if you're married, you automatically get one of these three. One of these three is available to people that are unmarried, but it's only available to them if they all buy at the same time and if they're going to be equal owners. So what you get as far as your ownership relationship is going to be determined by your situation. If you're married, you don't have a choice. You're going to be tenants by the entirety. We're going to talk about that in a second. If you're unmarried, well, you could be tenants in common, you could be joint tenants. If you tell me you want to have unequal ownership, I'm going to say, well, you have to be tenants in common because that's the only one that allows for unequal ownership shares. What I'm trying to get through to you here is there's a reason there's three different types of concurrent ownership. The reason is each one has its own place. Each one has a situation that it fits. Are you with me so far? Okay. So let's talk about the magic word here. When it comes to concurrent ownership, there's one word that matters above all others. I want you to put a big asterisk, star, circle. High, if, this, this is one of those ones where you just highlight the whole damn slide. Just say, this is important. Because this is one of the most important words in the class. Survivorship. Survivorship is this amazing legal tool that owners can use to save themselves a ton of headache and heartache when their partner, their fellow owner, dies. It only matters when one of the owners dies because it has everything to do with one of the owners dying. Let me ask you a question. If a husband and wife own a property together, and the husband dies, what happens to his share of the ownership in that property? It goes to his wife. It goes to his wife. You see how easy that just rolled off your tongue? It's an automatic answer. And it's a true answer. It goes to his wife. Did you need to look up anything to figure that out? No. Did you need to look at a contract anywhere to figure that out? No. It, and you know it because that's the way it happens, right? You know why it happens that way? Survivorship. That's survivorship. Survivorship is the legal idea that in some forms of concurrent ownership, notice I said what? Some. some forms of concurrent ownership that when one owner dies, their share is immediately transferred to the surviving owners. So in the case of a husband and wife, they would have survivorship with one another. If one dies, what happens to that person's share of ownership? It immediately does what? Transfer. Transfers over to the other one. They don't need to go to court. They don't need to file any paperwork. They don't need to wait for a will to be opened or read. It doesn't need to be a will. It happens instantly. The instant that husband stops breathing, what happens to his share of the ownership? It, to it belongs to his spouse. That is survivorship. Is everybody with me on that? That is survivorship. Here's, what, here's why that's such a big deal. If you didn't have survivorship, do you know how long it would take for that, that wife to own that property? A long time. Years in some cases. Let me tell you an ugly word. Probate. How many of you are familiar with that terminology? I've heard that word before, the word probate. If you've never dealt with it, consider yourself lucky. I hope maybe you never have to deal with it. Probate happens when someone dies. The probate process is the process of deciding what all their debts are, paying off all their debts, and then dispersing their assets according to their will after you've paid all their debts. The probate process can take anywhere from a few months to a few years. And if you left it, see, we tend to think, oh, he's got a will, that's awesome. It's useless when it comes to property. 
Because the truth is, if Sergio owns a property with somebody and he says in his will that something happens to me, the, the, who's somebody you might own property with? Give me a name. Um, Jose. Jose. Okay. Sergio owns property with Jose. And Sergio, so they each 50 50 owners. You with me? Two owners. They own it 50 50 together. And they each want to make sure that if something happens to one, their part goes to the other. Sergio can have a will. And he can put in his will. My half goes to Jose if something happens to me. Everybody with me so far? Sergio dies. Does Jose own all of it? No. No. And we're not even close to the point where Jose owns all of it. Because first thing, nobody's even opened and looked at what yet? The will. The will. It might be weeks before anybody even looks at the will. You with me on that? In the meantime, who does Jose own this property with? A dead man. It's kind of hard to work with a dead person, especially if you need to do something like sell the property. What if Jose can't afford the mortgage payments on this property by himself? Because who's not helping him pay it anymore? Sergio, because he's what? Dead. He's dead. So now Jose wants to sell the property, but he can't because who owns the other half of it? A dead man. And that dead man can't sign a deed. That dead man can't put the property on the market. So Sergio's got to wait. He's got to wait for that will to be probated. And here's the process. Whoever's probating Sergio's estate, I mean, Jose's got to wait. Sergio doesn't got to wait for anything. He's done. Um, but Jose's got to wait for that will to be probated. So now whoever is probating Sergio's estate has to send out letters to all the creditors, all the people that he might owe money to, and say, let me know how much money he owes you. Does that take a long time? Yep. Yeah. Because you have to give them a certain amount of time to respond. And so they send back and they say, you owe us this much money. Now here we run into another problem. Sergio doesn't have any cash in the bank. So what are we going to have to do in order to satisfy those debts that are outstanding on the uh, uh, on the estate. We're going to have to sell whatever asset Sergio had. Well, the only other asset he has is his 50% ownership in this what? In this property. So now, Jose, who thought he was going to get the property by himself, has to end up doing what? Selling as well. Because... The only way to pay off the debts is to sell the property. At the end of the day, Jose ends up with nothing. Not even his own half. He does end up having to sell too. Is that what Sergio intended? No. No. That will, folks, is very limited in what you can accomplish with it. But here's a much better route if that was the intention, at least for this property. If Sergio and Jose own that property together and they had asked for this right of survivorship and they owned it together with the right of survivorship, the instant that Sergio died, what would happen to his 50% ownership in that property? It would transfer to Jose. Regardless of what the will says, regardless of what the probate process is, it happens instantly. Regardless of what the debts are, none of that matters. It is an instant transfer of ownership. Are you all with me on that? Is that a much smoother process than going through the probate process? Yes. That's the benefit of survivorship. That's why it's so important to understand what survivorship is. Now, take that knowledge and apply it here. Not every type of concurrent ownership allows you to have survivorship. Some, you can have survivorship. Others, you can't have survivorship. So we've got to determine which ones allow for it and which ones don't. Yes, sir, Fred. So you made a comment and said the right of survivorship. Mm -hmm. They would have written that in. So that's obviously, it's not it's more than just the concept of survivorship. There's an actual clause. It'll be on the deed. Yeah. It'll be on their deed. Their, their original deed that where they took ownership of the property, it'll say as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. It'll specify that the right of survivorship exists between them. Because what that does is tells the whole world how to treat this ownership if and when something happens to the other one. Yes, ma'am. Is that is that um, I guess clause of automatically uh, in place for like a, a deed for a husband and wife? 
That's a really great question. Here's Miriam's question. If you have a deed between a husband and wife, or a husband and wife are deeded property, so they purchase the property and come into ownership while they're married. Now, here's what you need to understand. Deeds are at a snapshot, a point in time. I don't care that they're married right now. I care that they were married when they was. When they got that deed. They actually didn't sign it. The grantor signed it. But when they got the deed, when they took ownership of the property, I care that they were married in that instant. So the answer to your question is, yes, that's automatic. That's called tenancy by the entirety. Tenancy by the entirety happens when two married people take ownership of property in the state of North Carolina. Notice I didn't say when two married people own property in North Carolina because the truth is there's a difference between owning property and taking ownership of property. Can I own something that I owned from before I was married? Yes. Can I? Yes. yes. And guess what? Nobody waves a magic wand and changes your type of ownership just because you got married. So it doesn't so if you bought it when you were just dating, you're not going to be tenants by the entirety. Even if you get married after the fact, you're still not going to be tenants by the entirety. You're only tenants by the entirety if you were deeded the property after you already were what? Married. Married. So a married couple taking title to property is going to take title as tenants by the entirety. And when you take title as tenants by the entirety, survivorship is automatic. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to check to see if it's there. The whole idea of tenancy by the entirety is that you have how many owners? It's for married couples, folks. How many owners do you have? Two. We ain't in Utah. Okay? All right? There's only two. And what share do they each have? 50%. They're going to be 50-50 owners. Is everybody okay with that? 50% owners, 50-50 owners, equal shares. Automatic survivorship. Do you have a question? Well, so what you're saying, despite the status, the marital status, down the road from that transaction, that's still because when they inherited or uh, were given ownership as concurrent owners right. at the time of marriage, that stands. It does. It doesn't change automatically. Doesn't change. They're not together in the future when that property may be dealt with, however. So are you saying if they're no longer married, does it Correct. change? Yes, it does change the other way. When you're no longer married, you can't be tenants by the entirety anymore. Okay. Tenancy by the entirety is only for people who were married when they came into the ownership and who have stayed married. Okay, I wanted to correct. You can't get a divorce decree in this state without them absolving the tenancy by the entirety. They will dissolve that as part of the divorce. Okay. You can continue owning the property together, but you can't continue being tenants by the entirety. So that's a, a whole other structure of ownership that they'll have to do in that scenario. That'd be part of the divorce. Yes. Right. Okay. That'd be part of the divorce. The sense. divorce would change that tenancy by the entirety. Okay. Because the idea here is you can only have one spouse, and tenancy by the entirety says oh, the ownership is between spouses. And so once you're divorced, you're no longer spouses. Right. Yes. Question. Uh, let's say that I own a property before I got married on 17. After that, I will have the title as a, it will, I would be a, it would be a, I will own the, the property on 17 with a marital right. So this get, brings up a very valid question and I need you to pay attention to this because this is where this gets murky okay marriage law is a whole separate set of laws away from property law they intersect a lot because marriage law pretty much impacts everything you do I mean first and foremost you should view marriage as a legal contract between two people it's much more of a legal contract than it is any kind of an emotional connection Truthfully, marriage is. You can love somebody all you want to, and it doesn't have any impact. When you put a ring on that finger, you just signed about 6,000 legal contracts. Whether you knew it or not, you just did, including giving away half your stuff. 
That's what she just did in North Carolina. We, we, that's the way marital law works in North Carolina. Now that's separate from property law. So to answer your specific question, you bought the property as a single person, so you bought it in several states. It's going to, the on, your ownership is going to continue to be whatever it was before you were married. However, your spouse is now entitled to 50% of any of the proceeds that come from selling that or any of the income generated from it, and that's that marital interest that you're talking about. Your, your ownership doesn't change, but their interest changes in the property. And you now need their permission to sell, you need their permission to lease it out, they would have to sign any contracts associated with the property because of that marital ownership interest. But just getting married is not going to, nobody's going to go to the county courthouse and change the deed because you got married. So when you go look at that deed, how many people are going to show up on the deed? Two. Mm. Just you. It's going to be just, the, it's going to be the same deed you recorded on the day you bought the property. That's why when we sell property, we don't just look at the property itself, we also look at the people. What do you think one of the first things we look at about a seller when they're selling property, particularly um, uh, if the seller bought it when they were single. We look, have they gotten what? Married. We look at marriage records. Because if they've gotten married since they bought that property, even if the deed only has one name on it, effectively, how many owners does that property now have? Two. Two. Because of the marriage. And so, but from our perspective on the test, that's not going to automatically change. Now, you can change it. You can now become tenants by the entirety because you're now what? Married. Married. But you can only become tenants by the entirety if you buy the property after you're already married. So you need to buy the property again. Well, who owns it? Me. You. So who are you going to buy it from? Myself. Yourself. You're going to deed it. You're going to deed it from you as a single person mm -hmm. to you and your wife as tenants by the what? Entirety. And that would be how you would actually go about changing it from whatever it was previously to tenancy by the entirety. Okay, okay. Does that make sense for everyone? Yes. yes. So that would apply for other type of uh, ownerships, like tenancy in common, joint tenancy. It's going to stay whatever it was. The marriage is not going to change that. Because tenancy by the entirety only applies for people who take ownership of property after they're already what? Married. Married. It's the, the, the marriage has to come first. You can't have tenants by the entirety unless the marriage comes first. You can redeem it and change it to tenancy by the entirety, but the marriage has to come before the tenancy by the entirety. Exactly. All right, everybody good with me on that? Yes. The big advantage to tenancy by the entirety is this automatic right of survivorship. Spouses don't need to worry about, now they do need to worry about all their other assets, but they don't need to worry about their real property assets because with the survivorship being automatic, it doesn't matter if they own 20 properties together as tenancy by the entirety. What's going to happen with that 50% ownership in every single one of those properties as soon as one spouse dies? It's going to be automatically transferred to the surviving spouse. Does that make sense for everybody? And that surviving spouse could the next day, you're not even cold yet, can they sell the property if they want to? Yes, they can because they own 100% of it at that point in time. And that's a huge advantage, folks, because there are there are a thousand ugly situations that could arise from having a one spouse owning 50% of a property with their now deceased spouse. If they had to wait for that probate process to unwind itself, they may be foreclosed on before they could ever get through probate. Because they don't, what, what if the one spouse that died is the one that was working? And we don't have any income coming in. This place has got a mortgage. The surviving spouse can't afford to make the mortgage payments. They also can't sell the property because they only own what? Half of it. So that survivorship takes care of all those concerns. That's why it's such a big deal. Is everybody following me on why this is important here? Okay. So tenancy by the entirety. Other rules about tenancy by the entirety. We talked about they had to be husband and wife or married spouses. I should not say husband and wife now. Um, they have to be married spouses um, in order to have tenancy by the entirety. It has automatic survivorship. It's guaranteed to be 50-50 ownership. That's another sticking point for a lot of people when they're going through a divorce process. A lot of people try to make this argument, well, I paid all the mortgage payments. Guess what? Don't care. 
Because when you're a tenant by the entirety, it is defined as 50-50 ownership. It doesn't matter who's made the mortgage payments. It doesn't matter if it was your cash that paid for the property, not his. It doesn't matter. You have 50-50 ownership. Therefore, when you get divorced and that property gets sold, how are the proceeds going to be divided? 50-50. 50-50. 50-50. I mean, you're going to have divorce scenarios where you might have one spouse who used their cash to purchase the property. Let's say they got married and the wife had $400,000 in cash. And they used her cash to purchase a home for $400,000. Now they purchased it after they're married, so how, what's their concurrent ownership going to look like? What type of ownership are they going to have? Tenants by the entirety. So what ownership share do they have? 50-50. Now three years later they go get a divorce. And in the divorce decree, she gets the house. Well, what she gets is him out of the house. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But she's going to have to pay him for his 50% ownership. Now remember, she already paid for what? The house. The whole damn thing in the first place. Is that going to be a bitter pill to swallow that she's now got to pay another $200,000 to this person just to get rid of them? Yes. But that's exactly how it works. That's what tenancy by the entirety means. It's guaranteed 50-50 ownership, and no, you can't get out of it. <laughs> that's why it's automatic, is that, Leah? If you have a There's a prenuptial agreement? Yes, prenuptial agreements are recorded. Yeah. So there, that would be a publicly available document as well. And so it would it would dictate, you know, the prenuptial agreement would dictate, okay, I'm not going to have an interest in this property. Everybody understand her question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it, it would be pretty clear that that prenuptial agreement existed. All right? So far, so good? The last one here, and this is the biggest one, because this is unique to tenancy by the entirety. Look at that last bullet point there. It says one spouse cannot disinherit the other or sell their share without the other's permission. This is the only time where one owner can't sell their share without the other owner's permission. If you have unmarried owners, concurrent owners, I don't care what their ownership is with each other, one can always sell without the other's permission. Think about that for a second now. You dating somebody, you're in love. You buy a house with them because you're going to get married. You have a falling out, you break up. They can sell their half to anybody, and you have no control over that. You come home the next day and you have a new roommate, folks. <laughs> and that is entirely legal because you're not what? Married. You're not married. This is the only form of ownership where one can't sell without the permission of the other. We, we've made a cutesy little expression out of this. How many of you have ever heard the expression, it takes one to buy but two to sell? That's where this expression comes from. Because when you're talking about married couples, a single spouse can buy the property, but how many of them does it take to sell the property? Two. It takes both of them. So if you're ever sitting down with somebody and you're talking about helping them sell their house or representing them taking a listing and listing their property for sale and they're married, how many people would you better be talking to? Two. Two. How many people need to sign that listing agreement? Two. How many people need to sign that sales contract? Two. And how many people's name is going to be on that check when it comes at the closing table? Two. Two. Whether they like it or not, that's the way it's going to work when they're married. Everybody with me on that? That's the whole idea of tenancy by the entirety, isn't it? Because I didn't count if the spouse passes away, if the wait, or, well, okay. Say, well, never mind, that doesn't matter because they have some ownership. Right, if, they have, if one spouse passes away, the ownership immediately transfers to the other, so you only have one owner at that point in time. Okay, are we good so far on this, tenancy by the entirety? Now I'm going to back up here. 
I'm going to talk about the opposite end of the spectrum from, yes, sir. Uh, just for curiosity, the survivals uh, in, the, in the couples are just in North Carolina or is in the entire United States? In the entire United States. Survivorship works the same in the entire United States. This is not unique to North Carolina. Okay, that's a good question. That's a good question. All right? Now, this is the opposite end of the spectrum. Did you have a question for you or did you stretch it? No, uh, yeah. Okay, just wanted to make sure. I mean, I feel like you were waving down traffic back there. I didn't know if you were directing it to the air traffic or how to find it. Um, tenancy income. So, what, the house I bought with my wife, that's tenancy by the entirety. Right. If you bought it with your spouse, it absolutely yeah. is tenancy by the entirety. And it would say that on your deed. We, is it in Wake County? Yep. We could pull up the deed right now on the Wake County Register of Deeds website, and I guarantee it would have both names on there as the grantees, and it would say, as tenants by the entirety. <laughs> I'm getting the ideas. <laughs> It'll be there. It will be there. Just like mine says, as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. Right. Yes? What if um, one of the spouses decides to go invest in the property and the other one purchase it without the other one knowing? It takes how many to buy? It doesn't matter. Take one to buy, but how many to sell? Two. So the answer to your question is one can go out and buy all they want to. But how many owners of that property are there going to be? Two. And they're going to be tenants by the entirety, which means that second spouse, whether they know about it or not, they have a 50% ownership stake in that property, and that spouse who bought that property can't sell it, can't do anything with it without, they can't even rent it out because they can't legally sign the lease by themselves because how many owners are there of the property? Two. Two. Even though the deed won't be one. It won't be. The deed won't be one. Because when you go to that closing, they're not going to just look and take your word for it. They're going to pull your marriage records. They're going to do a search on you. When they see you're married, they're going to go, congratulations to you and your spouse. We see she's not here, but you should give her a copy of the deed because she owns half of this too. They know how shady y'all are. They know what you're trying to sneak around and do. Wait, 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 wait. Let me make sure I get this case. So if I just go by, go in with you and I, and buy a property. Mm -hmm. My wife would still be included with that mm -hmm. because of our marriage. Mm -hmm. And no matter how many we bought, she would be included. She's going to own half of whatever your interest is in the property. That's exactly right. Okay. Whether she knows about it or not, she okay. will. All right. And if at some point in time you want to sell one of those properties, you're going to have to inform her <laughs> of the existence of said property because you can't sell it without her signature. On the contracts, on the deed, on anything. Right. Okay. You need her signature because of the tenancy by the entirety. Yes, sir, but. What if they had an entity that was purchasing, like they had companies or flipping houses or just. But then that's not the person purchasing, that's the entity purchasing. So, like an LLC, right. that, that then the purchaser is the LLC. The LLC is not married, right? right? right. So, that the ownership belongs to the LLC. That's going to depend on the structure of the LLC. But we're talking about individuals purchasing. Right. Okay. Obviously, an LLC can never be tenants by the entirety because an LLC can't get married. Yes, I saw a hand. I thought. Did I? No? I'm seeing things. I'm hallucinating. Okay. Are we good? Now, the opposite end of the spectrum from tenancy by the entirety is something called tenancy in common. If tenancy by the entirety is people who are married, what do you think tenancy in common is? People who, are not people who are not married when they purchase the property together. And this one has none of the rules that come with tenancy by the entirety. Talk to me about the rules that come with tenancy by the entirety. What shares of ownership had to, had to be true with tenancy by the entirety? 50-50, because how many owners did it have to be? Two. 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 Take those rules away. So how many owners can, have, can we have with tenancy in common? One. As many as we want. What shares of ownership can they have? Whatever. Whatever we want. We can have, you know, three owners and one owns 98% and each of the other two own 1% each. That's fine with tenancy in common. There's no rules here when it comes to tenancy in common. But the trade-off, what was the other big rule with tenancy by the entirety? <coughs> you can't sell unless you have the other person's what? Permission. Permission. Take that rule away. So tenancy in common sounds awesome because there's no rules, man. You just do whatever the heck you want to do. 
There's a trade-off, though. Here's the trade-off. That right of survivorship that you get with tenancy by the entirety, you can't have it with tenancy in common. There's no such thing as tenants in common with the right of survivorship. So what that means is every single time a tenant in common owner dies, where does their ownership go? Their heirs. To their heirs through the probate process. Which means there's going to be a long, drawn out ordeal to deal with about the ownership of this property. Does that make sense for everybody? It goes to their heirs through the probate process, which means it's got to be worked through the probate process. Now, could they leave it to one of their co-owners? Could their, one of their co-owners be their heirs? Sure, but is that as good as survivorship is? No, because survivorship happens how fast? Immediately. Immediately. How long is it going to take if I leave, even if I leave it to my co-owner who's a tenant in common, how long is it going to take for them to actually own the thing? Years. Could be years. Depending on how long it takes to probate my estate. How complex my estate is. How many debts it has. How many assets it has. I mean, I've seen estates be open for four years. It's a long time. Long time. Everybody okay so far with that? So, no rules, but no real benefits either. So, if we have tenants in common, let's say if... Um, we take Cameron. We take Cameron and Annie, and they have bought this property together as tenants in common. Can Annie just decide tomorrow she wants to sell her interest in the property? Yes. Does she need to even consult with Cameron? No. No. She doesn't have to offer Cameron the first chance to buy her out. She doesn't have to tell Cameron she's thinking about selling. She doesn't have to get Cameron's opinion about who the buyer is. Cameron has no control whatsoever about what Annie does with her share of that ownership. <coughs> There's down, that's the downside to no rules. Does that make sense? It gives you the ultimate flexibility, but it gives you the least amount of protection as an owner. Is everybody with me on that? The reason it's called in common is because it's the most common form of concurrent ownership. It's what you get by default if you buy property with one or more other people as long as you're not what? Married. married to one of those people. If you're married to the person you're buying the property with, you're going to get tenancy what? By the entirety. If you're unmarried, you're going to get this one. Tenancy in common. There's one that sits in the middle. Are we good on this one so far? So we've covered two of the three. There's one that sits in the middle called joint tenancy. Oh, I'm sorry. Mary. I had a question about the two bullet points. Could about you, what? The, the first, top, uh, first two bullet points. So that says that you can own a piece of property with more than one person, mm -hmm. uh, undivided. But then the second one says you have equal right to possession and use of the land. You do. So here, here's, here's the deal I'd like to propose to you. You and I are going to buy a property together, okay? I, um, I'm going to let you own 95% of it. You put 95% of the money in, I only want a little piece of the action. I'm just going to put 5% in. Of course, that means when we sell it, you'll get 95% of the money. So that's good for you, right? How much access do I have to the property as an owner? 5% of it? 5% of the time? All of it, all the time. So think of how this might go and blow up in somebody's face. Let's say you have three families that buy a beach house together because none of the three of them can afford it by themselves. And the three of them go together and buy a beach house with the understanding they're going to divvy up the months. You take this month, we take that month, we take this month. Well, you take these weeks, you take this holiday. Do people do that sometimes? Yes. And that's all well and good as long as those people follow that rule. What happens when you go together and you buy that house together and the one family won't leave? What can you do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Because as an owner of the property, they have the right to occupy what, what amount of that property? All of, it. All of it. And what amount of the time? All, All the time. You don't get to put a piece of tape on the floor and say, here's your third over here. <laughs> if they're an owner, 
They have the undivided right to possess the property. What did we say possession was? The right to what? Occupy the property. So if they own any little tiny percent, they have the right to occupy that property all the time. That's what we mean by undivided right of possession. Okay. okay. And the other thing to remember about this, don't try to subdivide the land. That's another thing people like to do on tests a lot. This is not a subdivision of the land. If, if Catherine and I purchase, a prop, purchase 20 acres together, as 50-50 tenants in common. Catherine does not own 10 acres and I own 10 acres. We each own 50% of what? Of the whole 20 acres. She doesn't get to say this is my 10 acres and there's your 10 acres over there. I own 50% of every square inch of that property just like she owns 50% of every square inch of that property. So she doesn't own 10 acres as a tenant in common. She owns 50% of 20 acres as a tenant in common. And that's related more to value at that point, right? It's related to value and use because right. if we okay. said she owns 10 acres and she ought, she could divide it all. So here's my 10 and here's exactly. your 10, but she can't do that. It's not looked at. It's not viewed that way. Right. What she has is a 50% stake in the whole 20 acres. But that gives her the right to access it, use it, and possess it 100% of the time. All 20. All 20. And even if I only own one percent, how much of the property can I access? All of it. All of it. How much of the time? All, All the time. So you got to be careful who you own property with. Does that make sense for everybody so far? Now, the one type of ownership that sits in the middle is called joint tenancy. Now, these people are still going to be unmarried, and we know that because if they were married, they would have to be what? Tenants by the entirety. Why do you think there's two forms of ownership for unmarried people? Think about what we said about tenancy in common. What can you not have? Right. Survivorship. Survivorship. The right of survivorship. So what do you think is going to be true of joint tenancy? These are unmarried people who want to have what? Survivorship, right. survivorship between them. That's what joint tenancy is. These are unmarried co-owners but they want to have the benefits that come with that right of survivorship. They want to make it such that if something happens to one owner, that share will automatically go to the surviving owners. Is everybody okay with that statement? They're unmarried, but they want to have the right of survivorship. Give me an example of people who would want that. Unmarried people purchasing property together, but they want to have it so if something happens to one, that it automatically goes to the other. Go ahead. Siblings. Siblings, maybe? Sure. Business, what else? Business partners. Maybe business partners. You haven't hit on the big one yet, though. A couple living without marriage. A couple who's together but not married. Absolutely. I mean, think about what would happen otherwise. If you've got a couple who's dating, maybe they don't even engaged, but they're not yet married. They buy that property together. If they don't ask to be joint tenants, what are they going to be? An unmarried couple purchasing. What are they going to be? Oh. Tenants in common. A week after they purchase the property, one of them gets run over by a train. Dead. 23 years old. Do they like to have a will? No. No. So now they're dead. They don't have a will. And the surviving owner owns 50% of this property as a tenant in common with a dead person. You following me so far? That dead person who doesn't have a will, the state's going to create a will for them. Who's most likely to be their heirs? The state. Not the state. Who's most likely? Family. Their family. Specifically what family members? Their parents, if they're that young, are probably their closest surviving family. Does that make sense for you guys? So who's going to end up with the other 50% of that property once it goes through probate? Dead person's the dead person's parents. Did I mention that they hate his girlfriend? <laughs> they actually disowned him because they hated this girl so much? And now they own a house with her. How's that going to go over? Horribly. Is that probably what they wanted when they purchased together? No. Do you think that's what they intended? Mm -hmm. 
No, most likely not. They just assume that if something happened to one, it would automatically do what? Go to the other. They assumed it would, but it doesn't work that way unless you ask for it to work that way. The way you ask for it to work that way is you ask to be joint tenants rather than tenants in common. You say, we understand we're not married, but we don't want tenancy in common. We want joint tenancy so that we can have this right of what? Survivorship. Survivorship. Does that make sense for everybody? So like, for example, my deed to my house in Cary says, as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. Why do you think that was? I bought the house with somebody I wasn't what? Married. Married to. But we intended that if something happened to one of us, what would happen to the other's ownership share? It would automatically transfer to the survivor. Does that make sense for everybody? You had a question, Brent. I saw you. Um, if you were uh, tenant in common and there was a, a child, I'm just curious, if there was a child, would it go to the parents or the child? Child would be the first heir. If, if there's no will. If there's no will and the state sets up a will for you, it's called the law of intestate succession. You die intestate. That means you die without a will. And your first heir is your children. Um, second would be parents if there are no children. Is this have anything to do with leasing properties? Like if you go to lease something and you have multiple names, is this on there? Or is it would not be because the form of ownership is not going to have anything to do with the lease itself. Now, all of the owners would need to sign the lease because obviously you need a lease from all of the owners. But this only has to do with when they're selling the property, when they're dispersing the, the funds and all those kinds of things, and what would happen if one owner was to die. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is it more expensive to do that? It is not. This is, you're getting a deed on the day you close on the property. All this is is a matter of what that deed says. Does it say you're taking ownership as joint tenants with the right of survivorship? Or are you taking ownership as tenants in common? Or are you taking ownership as tenants by the entirety? Of course, you don't get a choice about the tenants by the entirety. You only get that if you're what? Married. If you're unmarried, you have a choice. Are you taking ownership as tenants in common? Or are you taking ownership as joint tenants? You make that choice when you purchase the property. A good closing attorney will always ask that question to unmarried purchasers. How do you intend, and they should be having a discussion with them about what the differences are. A good closing attorney. I didn't say all closing attorneys. I said a good one would ask that question. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Francisco. And can be bought after you close? It can be changed after you close. So just like Edgar's question earlier about could we change to tenancy by the entirety, we could redeed the property to ourselves. So if you have, for example, anybody in here own property with somebody they're not married to? Do I have anybody in that situation? No? None of you? Okay. All right. If you had somebody in that situation, if you had a client come to you and say, listen, I bought this house with my significant other and we're not married and we're kind of, and, you know, we're kind of concerned about what would happen to the property, if something happened to one of us, they could go back and get this right of survivorship. But what they would have to do is essentially sell the property to themselves. Because right now they're tenants in what? Common. And they want to become what? Joint tenants with the right of survivorship. So you look at that deed, who's going to be the grantor? Themselves. Themselves. And who's going to be the grantee? the same people, but it's them as tenants in common selling it to them as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. So essentially it's just a matter of recording a new deed to change it. So it can be changed, it's just a matter of recording a new deed. We actually did this a lot when, um, when the Supreme Court um, passed the Oberfell. I struggle with that name, decision two years ago that legalized same-sex marriage. Realtors across the state had tons of clients who had bought properties over the years as joint tenants with the right of survivorship because they couldn't marry their significant other. Does that make sense that that was a common concern among same-sex couples? Because they couldn't be married, but they wanted to have the ownership that most closely mimicked ownership among a married couple. So the most close thing you can get is joint tenants with the right of survivorship. So there were tons of clients around the state who would have been married at that time and could they have been. 
So there were lots of closing attorneys that would reach out to their previous clients who had bought the property as joint tenants with the right of survivorship and said, hey, now that this decision has been passed, if you're deciding to get married, let us know and we will change your deed for free for you. We will, once you get married, bring us a copy of your marriage license and we will redeed the property into tenancy by the entirety because now that was available to them. So yeah, it can be changed by simply redeeding the property. Yes, ma'am. Does the same rules for um, uh, ownership of, uh, what is it, ownership by the entirety, does that apply to joint tenancy? Like, you, you need the, the other? Does not. Uh, Miriam's question is, does the same rule apply that I can't sell my ownership interest without the other person's permission apply to joint tenancy? And it does not. Even joint tenants can sell their ownership interest without the other's permission. There is only one form of ownership where you can't sell without the other's permission, and that is tenancy by the entirety. That's the only one that locks you in that way. Tenancy by the entirety is also the only one that limits it only to two owners. We can have joint tenancy with the right of survivorship with as many owners as we want. We could have five owners, ten owners, as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. So it's still not, it's not the same as tenancy by the entirety, but it's as close as unmarried people can get because it gets you that right of survivorship. Go ahead, man. So on joint tenancy, say, you have, say you have four owners and one of them dies, that four, that 25% that is going to divide equally among the other three people? Mm -hmm. okay. So here's the question. I always draw this as a circle because a pie chart represents 100% of anything, right? So Amanda's question is, we have four owners, and the other thing you know about joint tenancy is that they're going to be equal shares. Joint tenants are always equal shares, okay? So we have four owners, and what do they each own? 25%, right? So let's just say we got Tom, Bob, Kathy, and Sandra, okay? So they each own 25%. And they're all joint tenants with each other. So you've got joint tenancy here, joint tenancy here, joint tenancy here, and joint tenancy there. Does that make sense for everybody? They're all joint tenants with one another. Um, one dies. So let's say that Sandra passes away. What's going to happen with Sandra's ownership interest? It's going to be equally divided out. It's going to go to the surviving owners. So what you're going to end up with is something that looks like this between Bob, Tom, and Catherine. So there would be three owners instead of four. So they would each go from owning a quarter to each owning a third. Because, and that would continue to happen until you get down to how many owners? One, which would own what? 100% of that property. Is everybody following on that? The whole idea of survivorship, think of the game of survivor. How many people are you left with at the end? One. One, right? And they get all the money. The same thing will happen with this property. Eventually, as the concurrent owners die, you're eventually going to get down to what? One. One, and how much are they going to own? 100%. Now, it is pretty uncommon to have more than two owners who want the right of survivorship, but it's possible with joint tenancy. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so once they sell their half, right, as joint tenants, will that eliminate survivorship? Hold on, hold that thought for just one second. Let me let me clear the decks here. That's a good question. I'm gonna answer, but just hold it, okay? Fred, did you have one? Yeah, I wondered if I'm reminded of the first. Going back to your four split, the person dies. Mm -hmm. Let's say that that person is married. Would not that just default to the well, spouse? Well, it, it would to their spouse because they would be tenants by the entirety for that one portion. So that would go to their spouse so first. It really wouldn't be split up four ways at that point. It would still be, or, uh, it, it would still be split in four ways because you would still have until the other spouse died, that, full, that quarter would still exist. Yeah, and then once that couple is dead. Because they own it together as a couple. Right, you need the couple to die. <laughs> That's the only way the survivor should be kicked in. And, and, and then in addition to that, if, if I had a partner that I wanted to purchase uh, property with, I really only have two options. Uh, sever, severality no. and joint tenancy? No, not severalty. Tenancy in common. 
Severalty means one owner. Even the, so if you have a partner you want to purchase with, it can't be severalty because that's more than one owner. Okay, so the common, it, it, it's regardless if your marital status is married, you can be part of uh, tenancy in common. But you would be tenants in common as a married couple. You, the married couple have tenancy entirety with each okay. other. Okay. But so it, 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 here, let, let's put names on this thing. All right. Yeah. Let's say that what's your spouse's name? Pam. Pam. So you and Pam are married. You go into business with Bo here. All right. Yeah. And you're you're going to buy property together, 50-50 owners. One 50% ownership is Bo. Right. The other 50% ownership is you and Pam together as a unit. You're a unit for that other 50% ownership. But the relationship between you is still going to be, bet not between you and Pam, but between Bo and between your marital unit is either a joint tenancy or tenants in common. Okay. Okay. Because you're not married to each other. Right. Now, answer Annie's question. What if one of them decides to sell? So let's say we're down to these three. And they're joint tenants with each other. Can one of them decide to sell their share? Yes. Yes, we're very clear about that. The only way you can't do that is if you have tenancy by the entirety. So they can decide to sell their share. I want you to look at the second bullet point here. What does that say? Requires that joint tenants do what? Purchase. Purchase at the same time. So let's say that Tom sells his share to Annie. Did Annie buy at the same time as Catherine and Bob? No. no. So can she be a joint tenant? No. no. Is she married to Catherine and Bob? No. So can she be a tenant by the entirety? So what does that leave her with? She is going to be a tenant in common with Catherine and Bob. Is everybody with me on that? But what are Catherine and Bob with each other? They're still joint tenants. And so therefore they still benefit from what right? Survivorship. survivorship. But does any benefit from this right of survivorship? No. Bob is tragically killed. Who benefits from the right of survivorship? Catherine. How much does Catherine now own of the property? Two thirds, right? How much does Annie own? One third. And they are what with each other? Tenants in common. That would be the resolution of that because it's not going to be divided equally this time because you only had one person who could benefit from the survivorship, that last joint tenant who was left. Does that make sense to everybody? So, yes, a joint tenant can sell their share, but what they can't do is have that person, that new person, come in as a what? As a joint tenant with the right of survivorship. That new person is going to come in as a tenant in common so because they didn't purchase at the same time. So that's a reclassification of ownership, right? From, for, for uh, what is it, Kate? Catherine. Catherine, right? Because she goes from joint to common. Just for this piece right here. Just for that piece. Just for the piece that was sold. She is a tenant in common with that new purchaser. Because what we had was Catherine and Bob. Right. And when you erased that, you said then then you would restructure that as tenants in common? Because there's only two left. Right. Work yourself through process of elimination. Are they are they married to each other? No. No. no we get that, but, it, but it's a different ownership. It's you're no. making it harder than it is. Right. Well, That's right. Exactly. You're making it harder than it is. Process of elimination. Are they married to each other? Did they purchase at the same time? So what do they have to be? Tenants in common with each other. They have to be tenants in common just based on process of elimination. Yeah. Okay. 
I noticed that North Carolina is silly because it's actually the joint tenancy in North Carolina is tenancy common unless you add this for the right of right survivorship. Yeah. That is a very valid silly, point. Okay. The way the statute is written, the way the law is written in North Carolina simply says you don't get survivorship unless you're a joint tenant and you ask for survivorship. However, there's no point in being a joint tenant unless you was. Unless you ask for survivorship. The only benefit of being a joint tenant is the right of survivorship. So here's what would happen. If you go to your closing attorney and you say, we want to be joint tenants, but we don't want to have the right of survivorship. The closing attorney is going to take the glasses off and look at you and go, why? Why do you want me to look like a moron when I go to the courthouse and try to record this deed? Because if the closing attorney goes down to the courthouse and tries to record that deed, the clerk of court is going to take their glasses off and go, Why? Why are you asking for joint tenancy and not asking for survivorship? That's like asking for a plate, but don't put any food on it. What do you need a plate for? You, know? you see what I'm saying? It, it, there's no purpose in asking for joint tenancy unless your goal is to get what? So you're right. It's a silly way we do it in North Carolina. So really, there's no. The truth is, you're never going to see joint tenancy unless there's also what survivorship. survivorship. That's just the blunt truth of the thing. So when you see joint tenancy on the test, you you assume yeah. what is present. Yeah. Survivorship. Yes, ma'am. Um, can Catherine sell her part to different people? Can she split her part up and sell it to different people? Sure, she can. Sure, she can. She can sell her part to two different owners if that's what she wants to do. So with the common tenants in common, the D, which was a joint ten tenancy, mm -hmm. then just gets refiled? Yeah, it would be it would be refiled because now kind of Catherine wild. needs a new deed anyway because she just took over ownership okay. of this other piece of the property, right? right? So when this when this share gets deeded over to her that her new deed is going to reflect that she has ownership of the, in fact, not only is Catherine going to get a new deed, but so is Annie, gotcha. you know, and that new deed is going to reflect that they own the property, because there's only one deed for the property, right? And that new deed is just going to reflect two owners. It's going to identify that Catherine owns 66.67% of the property, yep. and Annie owns 33.33% of the property as tenants in common. That's what it would say. That was my original kind of thought first question around the deed. So yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, imagine that three people are in tenancy in common. Okay. And two of them has 40 percent each one. Okay. All right, all right. Let me let me do it this way then. We got three owners, two of them have forty percent each. Okay? I gotcha. And the other one has just twenty. 20%. All right, I'm going to do it sort of like this. This is the 20%, and then we got a 40, something like that. Francisco's making me draw. Okay, 40, 40. There we go. And they're all, and we know they have to be tenants in common in a situation like this because they're what? Unequal shares. That tells us right away it's tenants in common. Okay. okay. And the two that have the 80% wants to sell it, their own shares. One purchase, sir, and the the purchase it wants the entire, the entire land. Is there any way to force the other? Yeah. No. Not, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. I don't think there's any offer they can't refuse. I mean, a Godfather style. I don't. I don't think we can. There's no way that I'm aware of you can force this person to sell their shit. Don't think so have to make them an offer and you know, make it sweet enough that they'd be willing to agree to it. Yes, ma'am. Ma it says usually equal shares, so if you wanted, okay, if they're unequal shares, we automatically assume it's tenancy in common, correct? Mm -hmm. So why does it say usually equal shares? It is theoretically possible to have unequal shares in joint tenancy, but again, it's like a unicorn. It's theoretically out there, but nobody's ever actually seen one, you know? And so, it, because if you think about it, joint tenancy, the whole purpose of joint tenancy is to have this right of survivorship, right? So imagine if Brandon and Devin buy a property together, and Brandon owns 90% of it, and Devin owns 10% of it. 
they probably don't want to have the right of survivorship because that's very unfair to, I mean, Devin's in there rooting for Brandon to die any time because, man, that's like a winning the lottery for her, right? Does that make sense? So it just logically flows that if you're going to be joint tenants, it's sensible to have equal ownership shares. All right? How do we feel about those three? They, they, I know they can, they, they can whir around in your brain a lot. I get that. Uh, but I don't want you to find yourself confused about them. Um, they, they, they should hopefully get a little more settled in there. All right? Pretty close to the, uh, to the end of this chapter, so I'm going to wrap this one up before we go to lunch. Other types of concurrent ownership that we talk about, the first is the condominium. So now one note I'm going to give you about condos that people tend to struggle with on a test is a real simple, straightforward thing. I want you just to just add it to your notes here. Anything can be a condo. Condos are not just residential. You can have office condominiums. You can have manufacturing condominiums. You can have residential condominiums. Any real property can be titled as a condo. It doesn't have to be just residential. Now, condos are a very interesting form of ownership. They are the most risky form of ownership from the standpoint of the people that own them. And here's why. I gave you a definition yesterday of real estate, real property, land. The definition of real estate started with the word land, right? Real estate is land and everything permanently attached to the land. Guess what you're not buying when you buy a condo? Land. land. There is no land that comes with a condominium. Not only are you not buying land, you're not buying the physical structure of the condo either. You're buying airspace. Does that sound like a little bit more of a risky purchase to you? Congratulations, here's your air. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> oh, no, you don't own the wall. I'm sorry. And you don't own the floor. And see, think about the implications of that. If I don't own the wall, can I move it? Uh-uh. Who do I have to ask to do that for me? The homeowners association. If I don't own... The structure, can I decide to repaint it? No. I'm not talking about interior repaint, by the way. I'm talking about on the outside. I don't like the color on the outside. Can I decide to repaint it? No. No, because I don't own it. Who do I have to ask? The Homeowners Association. Airspace makes it super risky. Here's the thing you need to understand about a condo that somebody's got to own the land. Somebody has to own the buildings. Somebody has to own the parking lots. Somebody has to own the swimming pool. We call all of those things together, the land, the building, the parking lot, the swimming pool. We call those the common elements. Who do you think owns the common elements? Everybody there. Everybody. A lot of people would say yeah, the homeowners association. Well, guess who the homeowners association is, folks? Everybody. It's everybody. It's everybody. So the truth is, let's pretend this is a homeowners association meeting. Catherine just bought in the neighborhood. Welcome to the party, Catherine. What did she buy? Air. She bought the air in her unit, but she also bought her share of all of the common stuff. But she owns that together with who? Us. All of us. We are all her co-owners. So does she own the swimming pool? Yes. Yeah, just like I own the swimming pool, just like Edgar owns the swimming pool, and Jesse owns the swimming pool. So if we're going to decide to, to leave the swimming pool open for an extra month, who do we need to talk to about it? Yeah. Catherine and Edgar and Jesse and Kevin and Bo, like, because we all own the swimming pool what? Together. Together. If we decide, if, if, if we're going to put a new roof on the building, who do we need to talk to about that? Yeah. Everybody, because everybody what? Owns it. Owns it together. If we're going to decide who can park in this parking spot, who do we have to? Who has to decide? Everybody. Do you know how hard it is to get everybody to agree on anything? That is what you need to understand about condos, folks. That is why when the market goes, what goes first every single time? Condominiums. 
there is so much more risk associated with a condominium than with a detached home you cannot even imagine. These are tremendously more risky purchases because of the nature of having to rely on your neighbors. People suck sometimes, folks. You're going to have people in that neighborhood who just say, no, we're not putting new roofs on the building. And Catherine's like, but it's leaking in my kitchen. And you know what You know what your neighbor, your caring neighbor's going to look at you and say? It ain't leaking in my house. No, I vote no. Is that a problem? Yes. Uh-huh. That's a condo. Welcome to a condo. You need to understand that because you need to convey that level of risk to your clients yes. when they're thinking about buying one. And I'm not anti-condo. I'm just pro-consumer. I want to make sure people understand what they're buying. Hopefully some of you are not condo owners who have just made you rethink. <laughs> you are. It, this is a very unique form of ownership because you don't own the most basic thing. What's the most basic thing about real estate? Land, Land and you don't own any. Oh, you do, but you own it with a hundred of your new closest friends that you never met before. Now, are you married to those hundred new friends that you own all this stuff with? No. Did you buy at the same time all of them bought? No. So what are you with all your new hundred closest friends? You are a tenant in common with your hundred new closest friends for those common elements. You own your unit by yourself, the airspace of your unit, but all those common elements are owned as tenants in common with everybody else. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes, ma'am, Jack. Why do people get into condos? Well, why do people get into condos? Um, don't have any other choice. If you want to live in certain, if you want to live, for example, Cameron Village, Unless you got a couple million dollars to spend on something all over the road, where you're gonna have to buy a condo. So certain th places you just don't have a choice. The location dictates the type of ownership. Cost might dictate. Condos generally are cheaper than um, detached homes, and they're cheaper because of less demand, because of increased risk. Yes, ma'am. So, how does buying a condo benefit you financially? Like, if you want to sell your condo, are you are you sharing your your profit with everybody else, or? No. Think about tenancy in common. What can I do as a tenant in common okay. anytime okay. I want to? I can sell my share anytime I want to. So they sell their share. Okay, so you're buying an area to live in. Mm-hmm. Okay or rent out, whatever you want to do. Okay. You buy, you make that financial decision because you think you it's a smart financial decision. The benefit is you get the use of that unit. You have to decide if that's a smart financial decision or not. Here's the thing, and this is what's so ultra important about condos. There are really well-run condominium developments that are great investments. And then there are horribly run condominium. What do you think you should look at if you're thinking about buying a condo? What's the first thing you should look at to see how well it functions? Location. Well, location, but the first thing you need to look at is see how well it functions. The HOA, folks. The HOA. How well does that HOA function? Are they collecting dues on time? Do they have, are people paying into the HOA? Do they have money sitting in accounts on reserve to do things like replace the roof and replace the set? Because all of that's going to be left up to what? The HOA to do. And if the HOA doesn't have money to do all those things, you just bought into something that's never going to be maintained. I don't know what that is. Um, does that make sense for everybody? So you got to look at the health of that HOA to make sure that things being run well. Yes, ma'am, Elite. So there's not a lot of condominiums and cooperatives in North Carolina. Don't lump the two together. There's not a lot of cooperatives. There are tons of condominiums. Okay. I can take you and show you a thousand within two miles of here. Okay. I didn't know that because in New York City, that's all there is is the condos or con or more cooperatives. Co-ops. Co-ops. Co-ops are a big city thing. Yeah. yeah. Big C. We're not big C here. We don't have many co-ops. New York, Philly, Boston, all have lots of co-ops. We don't. Condos and co-ops are definitely not the same thing. I realize that. The way they're structured legally. Are we okay on this? So, 
Keyword, how would you recognize on a test that they were talking about a condominium? What things would you look for? Airspace. You're buying airspace. That's one dead giveaway. What else? You don't own the they land. That you own the common elements as a what? Tenant in common with all the other owners. That would be another dead giveaway that you were talking about a condominium. Is everybody with me on that? What time are you going to break? Uh, probably in about 15 minutes. The carpenter called for you. She wants her to call for that. Okay. Good? There is a law in North Carolina called the North Carolina Condominium Act of 1986. It only applies to new construction condos. Only applies to new construction condos. Not resales at all. So don't get confused about what properties this applies to. If the property has already been occupied, is this law going to be in, in effect? No. It's only in effect when the condo is brand new. Now, if the condo is brand new, this law has a dramatic effect. Here's what it does. It says if you're buying a new construction condominium in North Carolina, then from the time you sign that contract as a purchaser, you have seven free days to change your mind. That's what a seven-day right of rescission means. You've got to know this law and you've got to know that seven-day period. Seems easy right now because it's the only one we've got. Oh, yes, seven days. That's easy to remember. Wait till we got 26 of these laws and they all have different day periods. That's what Christina, she's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. What you're going to learn is all these laws have a different sort of waiting period and you've got to know all of them. Well, with condos, it's only in effect if they're what kind of condo? New. New. And if it is in effect, how long does the purchaser get to change their mind? Seven days. Seven days. So, for example, Jenny could go in today, downtown Raleigh, sign a contract, purchase, brand new, condominium. Pay a $20,000 non-refundable deposit. Contract says $20,000 non-refundable deposit. Five days from now, she thinks, what in the world am I doing? Can she change her mind? Yes. Would she give her $20,000 back? Yes. yes. That is the whole point of a right of rescission. If you're buying new construction condo, you get seven days to change your mind in North Carolina. Everybody okay with that? It, now, as soon as it's been sold one time, this law goes away. It's only the first time it's sold, that condo. Yes, ma'am, ma'am. Um, what does it mean by documentation? As in, like, construction stuff or as in... So, basically, the documentation that the developer is required to provide deals with the HOA. How is the HOA going to be structured? Because the problem we ran into, and this is why this law was passed in 1986, the problem we ran into was a lot of condos were being created with no real structure for the homeowners association. Well, think about all the home things the homeowners association is going to be responsible for in a condo. The homeowners association is going to be responsible for maintaining the structures, for painting, for replacing roofs, or for doing updates. Well, if you don't, as a developer, set up a good, strong structure for that thing, you're going to have a mess in 10 years when these things need to be maintained and nobody knows what's going on. Does that make sense? So, the developer has to basically set up the structure of the HOA and provide all that information to the buyer as soon as they make their offer. And that's why the buyer has seven days. They have seven days to look over that and go, no, 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 this doesn't look right to me. Right. They can change so their mind. That's how the HOA is structured and ran. Mm -hmm. so. Most of the deals with the HOA. Because that's the most important thing about a condo, is the HOA. We good on this law? It only happens. So, for example, Davis Park. Mm -hmm. Davis Park. So they had five, five big buildings, mm -hmm. and then they, they did another three. So those three follow this. It's the first time year. they're sold. Right. And those other buildings built prior to that had the same thing just when they were Just when they were sold the first time. But if those owners that own in those other buildings that have already existed put theirs on the market right now as a resale, there would be no right for a buyer to change their mind. The idea is you're buying something that already exists, you should be able to do all the research you want to do about that thing. That's why it only applies to new construction. Yeah, so there's really only a set of buyers 
one set of buyers. The first one that flows through that unit. That's exactly right. Gets the benefit of this. Yes. Um, I am a little confused. Uh, when you consider that some, uh, a property is sold, when, when people sign the contract or when they go to the make the closing. When sold means under contract. Okay. Sold means under contract. Closed is when the documents are recorded and title is transferred. So sold simply means under contract. So they have seven days from when the property sold, meaning seven days from when they sign the contract. Okay. And what is the purpose of behind of this uh, act? It's to protect buyers who didn't know what they were getting into with these new construction condos. A lot of times the, the developers were coming in and were having people sign contracts maybe before the building even existed. You know, they were just buying it based on floor plans, and they were, and there was a lot of high-pressure sales tactics used about condos. And so the idea was, people need to have time to go home and look over all that because what would happen was he would invite people in and bring them into this big presentation and show them, oh, this building's going to have a doorman and it's going to have this and it's going to have that and it's so awesome. And you know, people just get blown away by it and they're like, yeah, sign me up. And then they go home and they start reading the fine print. Well, the building only gets a doorman once we've sold 80% of the units. And if you get the doorman, then your dues go up from $150 a month to $200 a month. And then they realize what they signed was crazy. So the state legislature stepped in and said, okay, because, in other words, to eliminate these high-pressure sales tactics, the best way is to give people sort of a cooling-off period to go home, read over what it is they're buying into, and have an opportunity to change their mind. But again, it only applies the first time that unit is sold, just when it's new construction. Yes? So just to clarify, it's not it's the closing, not when you just sign the contract on the property. You agree to buy the property initially, that's not when the three days start? It's when not three days, days. seven oh, days. Oh, sorry, seven days. From the time you sign the contract. Uh, that's, that's when it's sold. Sold means signing the contract. You don't get seven days to rescind the deed. That's a whole different ball game. Rescinding a deed would be after closing. That don't ever happen. That takes an act of God and Congress combined to get a deed rescinded. This is seven days from contract signing. So basically, you sign that contract to purchase that thing, you start a seven-day clock. And you got seven days to change your mind get all your money back. But only if it's new construction. Don't, don't try to get out of a resale one like that. It won't work. It won't work. We all good on that? Yep. Okay. Co-ops. We don't have them in North Carolina very much, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking on them. Uh, but you may see them on a test. So buzzwords to look for on a test. A cooperative is just a, a, another structure of ownership where you're not really buying land. In this case, though, you're not buying into an HOA you're buying uh, stock. You're buying shares of stock. And so that would be the magic buzzword you would look for on a test. If you saw anything about purchasing shares of stock in a corporation in exchange for being able to occupy a unit, that's a co-op. And so rather than the unit having like, oh, well, this unit's $450,000, the unit would cost 20,000 shares of stock. And it's just like any other stock. The way the value of the unit goes up is the cost of the stock goes up. Does that make sense for everybody? Um, you will never encounter one of these in your real estate career in North Carolina, most likely, because we just don't have them. They're very common in, in larger cities like New York, Boston, Philadelphia. Um, large East Coast cities have a lot of co-ops. We just do not. So realistically, you just need to be able to identify it on the test, on the national section of the test if it comes up. So, what are you going to be looking for? I'm purchasing shares of stock in exchange for a lease. That's a co-op. And that's really all you need to know about it. Townhouses. We stick them here in the end because people tend to run them together with condos. They should. A townhouse is much more similar to a detached home than it is to a condo because you're back to the basics here. Guess what you are buying when you buy a townhouse? Land. You are buying the land. And not only are you buying the land, but you're buying the structure that sits on the land. When you purchase a townhouse, you own the land and you own the building. 
the only difference between a townhouse and a detached house is that it happens to be connected to another house. They share a wall. We call that wall a party wall. I think it's because you can hear the parties on the other side of it. But that's called a party wall. That wall, that shared wall between townhouses is called a party wall. Um, and so when you see townhouses, they are much more like detached homes than anything else because you are purchasing land. So one of the quickest ways to tell if you're looking at a condo or a townhouse is to look at the, the property description and look at the number of acres. If you look at the acreage, what are you going to see for a condo? What's it going to say? Acres what? Zero. Zero. For a townhouse, it's going to be a small number, but it's going to be a number. It's going to be like 0.1 or 0.09 acres. So when you see that there's some acreage there, you know it's a what? A townhouse. If you see zero acres for the land, you know it's a what? It's a condo. That's the quickest way to tell what you're looking at. How that thing is structured is just look at the, the, the measurement of the acreage. If it says zero, it's a condo. Okay? Now, just like we have an eight, uh, a homeowners association with condominiums, we very often have a homeowners association with townhouses too. It is very common, even though you own the structure of a townhouse, to have the homeowners association be responsible for the upkeep of the exterior. Here's the reason for that. Look at these structures. These are townhouses. Do they share some common things on the outside? I mean, in addition to being connected to one another, look at the top. What are they? What is the most notable thing they share? A roof. A roof. Now. I own my, if, I don't own a townhouse, but if I owned a townhouse, I would own the roof over my unit. That's dangerous for my neighbors because what if I'm crappy as an owner and I don't maintain my stuff and my roof is the one that's leaking? Is it possible that the, the leak is in my roof but the damage is in my neighbor's property? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because the water could be flowing down in some weird direction and all of a sudden they got a water stain on their ceiling. Now, they can't force me to put a new roof on my house. Does that make sense? So, the more sensible thing is not to have me individually be responsible for that maintenance, but have it be maintained by what? A, and an HOA, which is really just all of us grouped together. So, with, homeowner, with townhouses, you should see a very healthy homeowners association as well that's hopefully maintaining the exterior of the property. That's not required, though. I will tell you, there are some townhouses, and you have to watch out for this. There's one right down the street here. If you go down uh, Wake Forest Road, you know where Bojangles is? At the corner of Bojangles and uh, Red Lobster and Walgreens. It's at the corner of Wake Forest and Old Wake Forest. If you go north on Wake Forest Road here, that stoplight. If you take a right right there on Old Wake Forest Road, there's a townhouse neighborhood called Brook Forest on the left on Old Wake Forest Road. There are three level townhouses in the front, two level townhouses in the back. That is a townhouse neighborhood where the HOA does not cover exterior maintenance of the properties. That is a disaster waiting to happen. And it's already happening over there because you've got people in like a storm like last week. How many people do you think have shingles that blew off of roofs over there last week? A substantial number. Is that going to lead to leaks? Yes. Yes. And if it does, it could it very well lead to damage in their next door neighbor's property. And there's not going to be anybody for that next door neighbor to call and complain to because there's no a there is an HOA, but the HOA is not responsible for exterior maintenance. So now they got to go convince their neighbor to fix their roof, and it's a mess. I'm telling you, so be careful of that. That's an important thing. But what's the biggest difference between townhouse and a condo? Land. 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 <clears throat> biggest difference is land. All right, final thing in the chapter here, timeshares. Timeshares, final thing. How many of you have ever been to a timeshare presentation? Oh, my God. Fun, aren't they? If you haven't been, don't. Do not, put, when you get that thing in the mail that says come for three days free at Myrtle, don't. Don't go to Las Vegas for free for three days. Don't go to Orlando for free. I can promise you, you'd rather pay. It's miserable because they're going to lock you in a room in front of a heat lamp with no food or water 
until you agree to buy one of these things. Okay? These are very high pressure sales tactic properties. A timeshare is basically a rental that you buy. So imagine if you rent the same beach house every year, year after year after year, and the owner of that beach house came up to you and said, you know what, rather than renting this thing, for you, you're paying us $5,000 a week to rent this thing every year. You just cut us a check for $50,000 right now and we'll give you that week every year for, forever. Well, if you already knew you were going to rent it every week, would that be a good deal? If, you're rent, if you've been renting it every year for 20 years, it's $5,000 a week. Would it be a good deal to pay $50,000 now and know you're going to get that week forevermore? Are you following me on that? Because in 10 years, you paid the same, you would have paid the same amount of money, but now you got it for free forever. Are you with me on that? That's a timeshare. A timeshare is purchasing a block of time. Rather than renting it all the time, year after year, you've purchased that block of time. North Carolina has a very specific definition of timeshares, and you have to know it for the exam. Everything's about fives with timeshares in North Carolina. It says a timeshare is the guaranteed use of a unit at least five times over at least how many years? Five, five years. So five or more time periods over the course of five or more years. So if on a test they say Travis is purchasing the right to use a property at Wrightsville Beach every other year for the next eight years, is that a timeshare? No. No, why not? Four times. It's not five times. How many times would I go if I was going every other year? Four, Four times. Now, does it meet the at least five years part? Yeah, it does mean at least five. Oh, five years, it's five years. at least five years, but it's got to be both at least five time periods and at least five years. Travis goes two weeks per year, once in spring, once in fall, to a property at Wrightsville Beach. He's paid one lump sum for this, and he has structured it over the next six years. Is that a time share? Yes. Yeah, because he's going at least five times, and he's doing it over at least how many years? Five years. Five years. If it meets that definition in North Carolina, it is a timeshare. So to figure out if it's a timeshare, you're looking for what? Five At least years. five or more occupancy periods spread out over how much time? Five At least five years long. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. If it meets that definition, it's a timeshare. North Carolina has very strict rules about the sales of timeshares. Very strict rules about the sales of timeshares. Vastly different from three other states, which have virtually no rules about the sales of timeshares. Where do you get invited to go for that three-day free, if you just sit through a 90-minute presentation? Orlando. Out of state. <laughs> Orlando. Myrtle Beach. Not just vacation areas, three specific states. We've covered two. Orlando's where? Florida. Florida. Myrtle Beach. Vegas. South Carolina. And Las Vegas. Nevada. Those three states have no rules when it comes to timeshares. They can literally lock you in the room until you buy something. And from the moment you sign that piece of paper, it's binding. You just bought it. And by the way, yeah, yeah, you bought it for $50,000, but we're going to charge you an extra $8,000 a year in maintenance fees. You just signed up for that, too. High pressure sales taxes. South Carolina, Nevada, Florida. You don't have to have a real estate license to sell those timeshares. You don't have to have any license to sell those timeshares in those states. Guess what you got to have in North Carolina to sell? Real estate license. So, North Carolina, you've got to have a real estate license to sell a timeshare. What is a timeshare? How many? What, what's the definition? Five. five or more uses over the course of at least, at least five or more years. Everybody okay on that? If it is one of those things, then you've got to have a real estate license to sell it. And this is why timeshare developers hate North Carolina. Look at that last one there. A five-day what? 
right to change your mind. See, you don't have to sit through that heat lamp in North Carolina. If you're invited to a free weekend at Wrightsville Beach for a time share presentation, go. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. And when they bring you in for that presentation, walk in and go, listen, you ain't even got to show me anything. I love it. I want the most expensive one you got. Here's my credit card. I just need to be back on the beach. Write it up. Because what are you going to do? You're going to go right back out on the beach, enjoy yourself, kick back, have a nice drink, go home, send them an email on Monday morning, I have changed my mind. I am exercising my right of precision. And you're going to do what? Cancel that contract and get all your money back. See, they hate selling timeshares in North Carolina. That's why they sell. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have a lot of timeshare developments in North Carolina. We do. It just means they're actually sold where? In those other states. You may use the time in North Carolina, but the sale is going to happen in South Carolina or Florida or Nevada. Because they don't want to sell them here because they don't want you. They know as soon as you walk out of it. Every person in the history of ever who bought a timeshare walk out of there an hour later and go, what the hell did I just do? Yeah. And if, so if in North Carolina, if you have that thought, all you got to do is send an email and say, I've changed my mind. <laughs> so they don't want, the timeshare developers do not want to sell here. They want to sell in those states where they don't have that kind of restriction placed on them. Does that make sense for everybody? Very strict timeshare rules. Having to hire licensed salespeople, that's a strict rule in and of itself. In South Carolina, they can literally put a Craigslist ad out. And you come in there in the afternoon and be selling timeshares. Because you don't need a license. But you do here. Somebody wants to sell timeshares here, they got to go through what you're going through. So there's just a lot of reasons that you don't see them. And this last one is also a big reason you don't see them. This is a big bullet point. I probably should make it a, a, a screen all by itself or a slide all by itself. I want you to add something to this last bullet point note down here because it's going to be something that's going to come up a lot on the test. Just that last bullet point. The North Carolina Real Estate Commission has the power to do a lot with people who have real estate licenses. But they don't have the power to do one thing. They cannot find anybody who has a real estate license. The Real Estate Commission does not have, so I have a real estate license. The North Carolina Real Estate Commission cannot find me. They can't make me pay a fine. They can't make me pay money. What can they do to me? Suspend your license. Suspend my license or even worse, what? Revoke, Revoke my license. Th th those are the actions they can take against me. But there is one group of people that the North Carolina Real Estate Commission can find timeshare developers and only timeshare developers. Nobody else, no other developers, not commercial property developers, not residential property developers, just timeshare developers. And here's how much they can find them. $500 per violation with no maximum total. So let's say a timeshare developer hires both to sit in the office and sell timeshares over this weekend. Now, Bo doesn't have a real estate license. Would that be a violation? Yes. Yeah, because you got to have a real estate license to sell timeshares in North Carolina. Bo talks to 165 different potential buyers over the course of that weekend. How many violations is that? 165. And how much is the fine per violation? 500. Five. So multiply 165 times 500, and that's how much that developer could be fined for that one weekend. Not that. I can tell you that much. Not nearly that. Does that, does that make sense for everybody? And what you need to recognize is that's the only time the Real Estate Commission can find because they're going to throw that in on a lot on a test. And it'll be so easy to talk you into it. You're like, because they'll say, you know, Jesse stole $37,500 from his trust account. Uh, which of the following actions can the North Carolina Real Estate Commission take? And one of the answer choices is going to be force Jesse to repay the $37,500. Can they do that? No. 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 One of the answer choices is going to be fine Jesse $10,000 for violating trust account rules. Can they do that? No. no. 
One of the answer choices is going to be revoke Jesse's license. Yes. Can they do that? Yes. Because yes. they can't find anybody with a real estate license. What's the only fine they can ever do? A timeshare developer. Not just developer, but timeshare developer. Okay? One last thing I want you to add to your notes, and I forgot to put it on the slide here. It has to do with holding timeshare payments in what we call a trust account or an escrow account. A trust account is an account where you hold people's money, you safeguard their money. And when somebody does purchase a timeshare in North Carolina, the developer can't touch that money for a certain amount of time. That period of time is 10 days. So any payments that you make for a timeshare in North Carolina have to be held in escrow for 10 full days. Why do you think that is? Both said it. I heard it. In case they change their mind during that five day period, you could you still have the money available to do what? Give to give it back to them. In case they change their mind, you still have their money available to give it back to them. Could you repeat that again? Any payment made to timeshare? Any payment made to a timeshare developer has to sit in the trust account for ten days. So they can't touch the money for that full 10 days. You said trust account? Trust account. Or escrow, right? Trust and escrow mean the same thing. Okay. Trust account is an escrow account. Yeah. All right, everybody good with that? That is it for, we don't need to worry about planning yet developments. That is it for chapter two, finally. See, I told you we got in that one yesterday. That's a long slog through chapter two. So it's time for your lunch break. Why don't you come back at, uh, say, uh, five minutes past one. Okay? Five minutes past one. I'm sorry? Pods are not contested. Correct. Okay, that's what makes it. That's what makes it a time share. Okay, thank you. Let me stop again.